So I'd like to start by thanking everyone for uh, attending, uh, especially our out-of-town guests, uh, former students, alumni, uh, and close colleagues and friends uh, of the school. Uh, my name, for those of you who don't know, is Christopher Romano. I am currently a research assistant professor in the Department of Architecture, and also uh, very proud to say an alumni of this program, uh, both undergrad and graduate degrees. Uh, I'd like to start um, first by introducing the, and the screen goes up, right next to me. Start by introducing the panel and then uh, briefly talk uh, or maybe expand on uh, the topic or the way that it's been framed, a culture of making. And then I'll turn it over to each of our guests for a series of short stories uh, or talks about the work they do. Um, and then we can um, sit and open it up for discussion. So um, the first, Gabriela D'Angelo, who joins us from Ithaca. Uh, also alumni of the University of Buffalo, received uh, a bachelor's degree in 2006 and an MR in 2008, and is currently an assistant professor uh, at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Uh, the second, James Bruch, um, alumni of our program as well, with the BPS in 2006 and an MR in 2008, currently a senior architect at Workshop for Architecture in New York City. Third, Tad Heidbergen, um, who currently uh, joins us from Detroit um, and is an assistant professor at the University of Detroit Mercy and principal of et al. Collaborative. Uh, and also, I think, uh, as a graduate of Cranbrook, uh, has a lot of philosophical affiliations to the way, um, certainly, that some of the faculty here uh, approach the problem of material uh, in relationship to design, so we're glad to have you. And lastly, Jared Oakley, who received an MR in 2004 from the University of Buffalo, uh, is currently a project manager at Architectural Resources. Um, so I'm uh, very, very happy to have this panel and uh, honored to be um, introducing this topic, um, a culture of making, looking forward, looking back. So for many years, uh, the school has nurtured a culture of hands-on work. We are invested in making things and experimenting directly on and with materials. Um, blending traditional methods of building with contemporary methods of digital, digitally driven production. This is spearheaded through an intimate relationship between our shop, one of the largest in the country, and our growing digital fabrication facilities, which in many ways have become part of our pedagogy and more importantly, part of the identity of the school. We also have seen this trend uh, most recently in, in industry giants such as Autodesk's Pier 9 workshop in San Francisco, where both cutting edge software tools and hardware tools are accessible within a single space. This has led to an academic environment where acquiring a deep knowledge of tools and materials is more the norm than the exception and one can identify a number of historical residences, from the medieval guilds, to the arts and crafts movement, to the curriculum of the Bauhaus, to name a few. And I feel as a purveyor of a discipline where the primary media are materials, I believe architects must develop an intimate and tacit understanding of materials and their properties. It's for this reason I would like to believe that we are an institution known for making where students reach to materials first in the exploration of a design problem, where they fearlessly experiment with using materials in novel, unexpected, and innovative ways. Prototyping their ideas at full scale and testing what they draw on the screen. And perhaps resulting from this design build ethos, our school has seen a vast number of students and faculty dig deep into the meaning and use of material, from altering the ingredients of typical concrete to enhance its textural and uh, grippiness, if that's a word, or layering the, laying the groundwork for new structurally based thinking with engaged textured metals, or poetic notions about how materials interact with light simultaneously absorbing and reflecting the ever-changing solar conditions. 
In all of these examples, of which there are many more, obviously, we are suggesting moving beyond traditional cues from precedent toward contemporary innovations in material behavior and in performance. There is no drop-down menu in any of our software platforms for working with materials such as glass or terracotta. In every case, we have had to get our hands on the material to better understand its architectural potential and more important, its material behavior. So as a framework for this panel, I have asked our speakers, what are the next set of issues that will guide material innovation? Uh, organized very loosely uh, by scale, small, medium, large, and as an homage to Rum Poolhouse and Bruce Mel, I know I may have replaced extra large with huge uh, for our last speaker. Uh, each will tell their story about how thinking through making has altered the way we as architects work. So with that, I will turn it over to Gabriela D'Angelo. Thank you. and building at the one-to-one -one scale in tandem with the 
research, drawing, and these micro models that I'm constructing help me think through each of the designs and test their feasibility and their validity. You know, you start to question, is this idea that I have in my head, this idea that looks so good and fever and these kind of various representations and model, is it actually going to work the way that I imagine? Does it fit and function the way I assumed and calculated for? Do those connections actually fit and work? Sometimes a happy mistake leads to a critical revelation that's really positive, and sometimes it sends you back to the drafting table. But in any case, again, there's this kind of back and forth in the dialogue that helps you to get to a point where you feel like something is completed or it's, it's worthy, it's worth, it's worth the effort that you're putting into it. And um, making for me is also about the activation of the design. It often flips the idea of the maker onto the user of the structure or landscape as they are the ones who are ultimately creating space through initiation and inhabitation. The projects, um, or in projects like Sound Garden and Pop Up Sound Garden here, space is made only through the projection of sound. A platform and a structure are presented, but an architecture is only there, it's only tangible through the intangible waves that are created by the structure, by the, by the person who's initiating the sound through the structure. In garment texture and inflatables, the person wearing the structure has the option of expanding um, or expanding each garment into its architectural counterpart through bending and folding, hinging, buttoning, um, and in this case through inflation. And recently, in a playscape project I worked on this summer, where we designed and built using the materials cut down from the site, I experimented with leaving some of the basic materials on the site. And this allowed for the kids who we designed and built for to actually add to the design of the park and create structures, which was really cool to see. And they were a part of the design process the whole time and were kind of watching us the whole time building. So allowing them to do that after they had been watching us was a really cool experience. Um, and whenever possible, bringing the one-to-one -one scale exploration into the studio is something I try to orchestrate. I think there's a real value in the education of the architect to dream without consequence, the representation of idea without having to think through the feasibility completely. And on the counter, there is an obvious value to executing ideas at full scale in order to work out the kinks on a practical level. So I challenge my students with occasional uh, small scale projects. Um, sometimes an extension of the work I'm investigating or projects that I'm working on. Um, and sometimes just projects I thought were cool when I was a student that I was working on. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm working in a really small city called Geneva, New York. And as soon as the community gets wind that you're somebody who is willing to not only think, but to actively create what you are trying to conceive, they come to you with a lot of projects. And I try to bring those into my classroom as well when at all possible. So um, sometimes we're engaging with community design build, like for this meditation labyrinth for a neighborhood pocket park, thinking through nature and the act of meditation and carving into the landscape brick by brick our design that we constructed. Sometimes they're engaging with tactical urbanism um, and large piles <coughs> and pallets, breaking them down and creating or crafting temporary public spaces, like Geneva, New York's first parklet, various outdoor seating, and bike racks around campus. And sometimes we're collaborating on an architectural installation for an exhibition. In this case, um, or in any case, I think pushing their process and building on the idea of an embodied knowledge through the act of making, I believe, is crucial for the education of the architect, but is also vital for the continued development of the practice and our built landscape in general. So that's that's it. She said she was going to screw up her talk, so I didn't look so bad, but uh, she did pretty good time. <laughs> uh, anyway, my name is Pat, um, and I'm going to probably talk a little bit about um, some of the things that I uh, kind of know about your guys' program here, uh, just in terms of as a, I've come here a few times to reviews and critiques, so I've always been impressed with the, all the, the crap and the, and the 
hallways in the, in the space where you just have all these models and all these kind of things and things don't work and you know people are almost injuring themselves and you know, worry about lawsuits and those kind of things. And that's like something that, you know, at my institution we're a very, 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 very small school and uh, we just finally got our first CNC router. That's how, how cool we are, we're so excited. Um, but, uh, and a 3D printer, all in one day. Uh, but the uh, kind of thing that I'm gonna talk about a little bit today is like how, one of the, one of the topics that, that was posed was like where we wanna see the idea of making going towards boards. And I think that sometimes I find myself in the city of Detroit um, struggling a little bit from my education, which was a lot about making, about fabrication, and about like these small details, and all these intricate things engineered out, like, you know, really kind of interesting. And then you've gone into the city where, and this is like the camp on something it's like Gabriel, uh, Gabriel was talking about, was like the idea of the community, and how do we actually engage them and bring them into the process because a lot of our clients, I'm sure if anybody's practicing architecture, don't really want to pay for all that experimentation, right? So a lot of it has to be done in academics or on personal research levels, or you're famous and someone like will pay you a lot of money to do it. So I'm a part of a practice that we have a outfit in Brooklyn and in Detroit, and we basically work in a collaborative manner. Uh, we bring partners on and off. Um, but I was gonna kind of talk today a little bit about like how does making play a role in architecture practice, but also in education. So this is my house. I currently live there. Um, and this is uh, something that we do a lot in Detroit. We actually actually buy, I got this house for a dollar. Uh, there's a lot of complications that come with that, like asking the guys that live there to leave. Um, but also, um, <laughs> twice, <laughs> help them move their stuff out. Um, but also, there's a couple, there's a lot of uh, legal issues that come with uh, property ownership. Nobody knows who owns property. Uh, banks don't really want to claim the property, and there's like a lot of stuff. So, you know, I was kind of, Looking around, and this is a neighborhood uh, which is actually pretty fancy now called Corktown. And I was thinking about some things I was working on when I was at Cranbrook, which were these kind of basement studies of underground um, spaces where I was, uh, without permission, digging a knife hole in front of the museum on campus, which is a pristine ceremony design, and kind of uh, building these kind of uh, artifacts that you would kind of inhabit below and on top. But it's really about trying to gain scale through economies. Uh, and so I'd love this to be like a really fancy, um, like a sale, boat sale, or something. I need to find a sale boat manufacturer or something. But, but the idea of just kind of building these kind of uh, sculptural events where people start to experience something. And the idea of that is like to start conversations. So in the house itself, um, these, this is all, all work I'm just kind of showing first is kind of in progress, so it's not really super sexy yet. But this is the sexiest part of the house, which is the staircase. <laughs> which is not that sexy. Um, when I got the house, it was kind of full of uh, drop ceilings, vinyl tile, um, and so part of it's been re uh, the idea of removal. So I had this idea that we have all this vacant space, all this vacant property, uh, big, big old buildings, big factories. How do we actually subtract to design versus add? So it's kind of, you know, I've been playing around with in the past, obviously, I'm not like the inventor of that idea. Um, but I also, this is my kitchen currently. Um, if you guys know Charlie, well, Jeannie, this is his refrigerator on the left, um, <laughs> which doesn't really work, but um, it's like this idea that we're, this is not like the final, this is a mock-up, basically. So I basically mocked up the entire house, started removing walls, um, and started kind of building out. It's a really low-tech way uh, to make sure I have my um, gas, gas grill there. Um, but the idea around the house itself is to kind of remove a series of floors, you know, so you're gonna move this, that, and the other, but swimming pool in the basement, Put a little pickling cellar over here. Um, that's uh, stage 11, which is the prison at the top. Um, and kind of just like using a house to explore. And this is kind of a process that's being used a lot in the community that I'm at, where you know, we have a house that's called a squash house, which is actually you play squash and grow squash in the back. There's you know, a playhouse where you actually play. It's a playground plus also a play um, area. People live in these conditions. And I actually live in this condition. <laughs> but um, again, these are just kind of in progress. But what I'm finding from this kind of exploration is, uh, besides on gaining asthma, is that um, the you know the kind of process of learning through the material kind of evolves as you're kind of working with it. So the initial designs were a lot more finessed as the thing kind of progresses. This is something that we all kind of play with in architecture. We have a great idea, then we we design stuff that's really not um, where we thought it was going to end up, but sometimes good. 
The second part of this is actually the community part, which started from another couple studies where I was uh, doing these kind of uh, chair graffiti projects. Um, and this was actually my first uh, time I was using any kind of digital fabrication. Um, but I was always, I kind of took out the, I was trying to go 2D to 3D directly versus 3D to 2D to 3D, if that makes any sense. I wasn't trying to model it and then build it. I was actually kind of drawing all these different types of shapes and forms. And these are two of some of the more basic ones, but I tried to folding them up and then applying them throughout the city. Um, and then this is my wearable architecture, um, but it was also talking about community spaces. Um, and then it kind of started to talk about, this is a project, this is a professional project, this is for the Red Bull House of Art, which we used, we used uh, an existing um, brewery in the city of Detroit, uh, and this is actually slides, mostly two, two slides over, <laughs> I put it in the wrong spot. But this was talking about the idea of that subtraction a little bit, but using the reuse of the spaces, because the city itself uh, has a lot of these kind of hidden gems um, that we don't necessarily get, but um, this is, detail of a restaurant that we worked on uh, that I was going to talk to you guys a little bit about this in terms of how do you um, bring in a little bit of the, the fabricate tour. Uh, this was like another installation project um, that was more of a political statement. There's been a lot of conversations in the city of Detroit, education being number one, second one being uh, food desert type conversations. And during the Super Bowl, they asked us to design all these kind of storefronts, and they're all like, you know, super crazy designs, tessellations, and all those kind of beautiful things. And we just ended up just designing a grocery store, because that's actually what we needed. Um, the salt hand, of course, no, no lasers. <laughs> um, and then going back to the idea of making. So we, we, this is my house actually right there. This is, I'm on top of the train station here taking this photograph. This is kind of the hot neighborhood in the city where it's like a, barbecue restaurant, coffee shop, it was downtown. Uh, this is a project that started off from um, Daimler Chrysler came to us when they were still Daimler Chrysler and they said, hey, you got, uh, we have $10,000 um, and uh, we want to come in and lead the, the park. And we're like, well, that's worthless. What's, what's beating the park going to do? And so what we did, we started leveraging um, the actual physical spaces. So I'll go up to here. This is the first thing that we did was actually built this kind of reflection garden. Um, but we started using the community uh, to kind of help us uh, start building. And what was kind of interesting, we built this little island first, and they came back the next year, and then we built this $250,000 garden, uh, which is here. It's kind of cut off there in front of the train station. And what it did was actually kind of made the park in habitable. When I first moved to this neighborhood, there was literally a, a series of uh, uh, tents um, there where uh, displaced people were living, uh, some of the bottom all Eddie Bauer tents, and then like three weeks later, it was very sweet actually, but then three weeks later the police came and removed them all. Um, but this was actually the most photographed space in the city, but everybody was always kind of really intimidated by it. So what we did, we started actually building this thing as like kind of a political statement. We built this, and then the, the same day, the guy who owns this, Maddie Maroon, who owns the bridge to Canada, started to kind of clean up his, the building and actually started to uh, remove graffiti along the entire facade. So we started using the idea of physical exploration to start to kind of create physical change in the community and neighborhood. And now, if we go back to here, the house that's here is another house that people were asked to move out of. He didn't like my music, the guy used to live there. Um, and they just sold these abandoned houses for $120,000. And it's just like, and I'm not trying to promote that because that actually puts me in a lot of problems. But, um, but at the same time, uh, it's starting to kind of manifest to actually uh, change just by action, and just through community um, engagement. Uh, this is the last project that I'm currently working on, uh, and this was a photo from yesterday. So uh, we're, we bought this building here, which is right across from the University of Detroit, um, with the kind of hopes of developing uh, a network a, a, a connection to this neighborhood behind here, which is one of our Forest neighborhoods in the city, which is right. This is the university. It's a school of architecture. I really want a coffee shop, so I'm just going to build a coffee shop here. Um, and then the idea is like all these houses here with the marks were all kind of city-owned properties. And so we've been working with the city to kind of actually secure those properties. But in the meantime, we actually went back and purchased this building, which we were going to use for fabricating the houses. Um, but we ended up like kind of engaging the community, finding out what they need through a series of events 
So we built our own little coffee shop from the old signs that used to be in the space. Uh, this is the Astor Gates from Chicago uh, coming in, actually working with the neighborhood inside of our building. Uh, that's me looking really excited in the back. Um, but uh, then we kind of started solidifying a series of different things where we started working with, um, you know, trying to build out infill housing along with our projects and, and creating these green paths into the city. And what's kind of interesting is this neighborhood has just recently been selected for um, this $5 million uh, night grant that is going to kind of start developing the greenway path between the University of Detroit and University of uh, or, uh, Mary Grove College, which is about a mile away. And it's kind of interesting in terms of the evolution of making a small statement and how, I'm not saying we're responsible for that, <laughs> I'm saying that we're kind of part of that conversation of how do you use um, examples of a built environment to kind of uh, change the community. Because in reality, nobody needs a, a house to be, they need jobs and being respected and a lot of other things we both live here, but they don't necessarily need that. Uh, that's an old rendering. Um, but that's yesterday as well, so this is framing <laughs> the roof. Um, and so we'll be kind of opening that up hopefully this fall. By the way, there's an event there tomorrow <laughs> uh, for this uh, design festival. So we, uh, within a day, the day, last few days said, hey, can we get a roof on your building so we can have an event in there just in case it rains? And so basically I had to build the roof in a week. Um, and so it's, it's, it's cheap, it doesn't really have roofing on it. Um, the last one is not necessarily a, a making project, but it starts talking about that community element that, of trying to instigate through um, the idea of representing things physically for people that may not understand how things are uh, urban, urbanistically. So this is actually a project that was used to kind of uh, uh, to have conversations with um, the city of Detroit who basically gifted an arena to uh, Little Caesars and their hockey team. Um, and uh, we were, they weren't actually talking to the community at all. And I think the community didn't really understand um, what was actually occurring in terms of the uh, the kind of land ownership and purchasing and, and all that kind of stuff. And so what we tried to do is actually, we created this game. Again, I'm, I'm, I was trying to end on something that's really just not about craft, but uh, just about kind of the actual physical, where the idea of uh, showing something that is, um, like the, everybody basically in the community was able to kind of come in and, and build their own arena district, just like, uh, I don't want to use that word Legos, that's awful. Uh, Analogy, but the idea of actually kind of having the community involved in actually building things. So it's not to the level of where they're at, the kids are actually kind of building with the logs, but the idea that by just activating them, the community into it, then they understand the process of making, um, or the process of physical space is important to them. And then you can start to bridge those conversations about actual physical um, construction. Things. So, so that's it. A little bit different. <laughs>
Now, um, you know, talk to technology, you argue with it, you reach compromise. Um, and do you want to punch technology in the face at times? Absolutely, right? Um, but it's, it's really using the best of both worlds to yield the best results. And I think that's something that UB has really given me and that I really take um, every step of the way, even to this day, I really try to think how can I really embrace both sides while thinking about you know Omar Khan side of my brain as well as the um, Brad Whale side of my brain. You know, try and really uh, marry the two so that um, in the end it's really the product which really speaks for itself. Um, and I'm going to show some examples today, which are just from my experience. Uh, four projects which touch on these four areas. The first is uh, making as problem solving. So uh, architects are in a strategic position to be um, the most valued problem solvers. If you think about it, we have to synthesize extreme amounts of information to satisfy uh, not just one client. I always think there's three clients every project. There's the client, there's architecture, and there's yourself. And you have to satisfy all three of those clients. And this project was for a competition for a uh, new museum of uh, light dance. And working with the principals, everyone wanted their own design. Everyone. They're like, no, it has to be this, no, it has to be this. Here's a problem internally. How do you, how do you solve matters between people internally before we even go to the client? So I was the lead model maker on this, and I recommended why not show multiple models for the interview? Why not try to elicit thoughts, ideas, prove to them that we are so uh, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary that they have no choice but to choose us? Uh, this is actually uh, the size of Little Sushi. Um, and what we decided to do was laser cut um, the sites on the opposite side so that we could actually place the models within um, this little piece. Um, and in the end, the project went belly up because of some investors, and to this day, it's considered just a sushi box. But um, going back to my idea, uh, my thought of analog versus digital, it's not versus, it's analog and digital. Uh, some of these models are 3D printed, some are uh, hand chiseled, some are machined, there's concrete, there's uh, laser cutting. Um, some are actually cast out of resin and put in um, uh, pressure pots to get all the air out. And then you polish it and make it very, very beautiful. And in the end, this is actually uh, what the principal went to the client with for the interview. Just a simple uh, carry-on, which was um, checked at the airport, went to the interview, and next day we got a call that we won because they really, really appreciated the fact that we're not jamming one idea down the throat, we're actually thinking about the world of possibilities and the world of impossibilities because here's someone with a lot of money, they want to build a building, we're not limited to using one idea. If you hire us, you're going to get a number of thinkers, designers. Um, so we actually took the problem in the first place and used it as the solution. Um, making as performance, this is a, a, a performance space at Alex Tully Hall, which is based on Lincoln Center. Um, I was brought in as a junior designer and model maker for this project, and we knew that in order to use a material to um, enhance the acoustics of a space, the material has to have multiple properties. It can't just be wood, because wood has a certain sound absorption coefficient. There's other, there's other materials that are better. So we started looking at composite materials, uh, inspired by a bioluminescence um, sea creature, something that glows, something that's self-sufficient, um, something that can live on its own, but also something that's a little squishy and malleable, something formable. Um, so we ended up working with uh, Freeform, who are based out of Salt Lake City, Utah. Freeform, they specialize in these um, cast and extruded resin products which is actually sourced from another company. They actually just put a fancy label on them. Um, but they have a full team of fabricators. Uh, you see the guys here who heat the, 
resin form, and they have these jigs which end up creating this uh, formed uh, panel. And this is just a mock-up on the left-hand side, a drawing of the mock-up, which shows how these form panels are essentially very, very thin, and you could use the rear space as a means of ventilation as well as lighting. Again, we want to use material for light, sound, structure, um, thermodynamics, uh, beauty, you name it. We're trying to find the holy grail of material for such space like um, uh, a performance hall, like Dallas Public Hall. So, um, mock-ups are really invaluable. You, you cannot, um, well sure you can spend a lot of money on a mock-up, but uh, the, the fact that you emulate the experience before the building is actually built, that is an incredible um, and priceless investment that you can make to uh, really see if something performs to what your original design intent is and make any adjustments as necessary. So there's just some of the pieces for the mock-up and you can see this is just how the panels um, were able to be lit from the rear um, just using some LED. And uh, the material is actually composed of resin and, uh, and this African um, veneer called Moby. It's actually like, it's like the African teak. Um, and we went with African teak because it's actually more pliable than American teak. American teak tends to be very brittle when it becomes a veneer. Um, and, but using teak, it has more resistance to molds, um, uh, moisture, it's more stable, and it actually has um, like a, a thousand uh, less sound absorption coefficient. And for someone like Lincoln Center, they want the maximum uh, reflection through sound so that when you're in the space, you're hearing the sound, not a percentage of the sound. Uh, we ended up working with Theory Technologies. Um, uh, we hired them as a consultant. Um, they used Katia to basically map out all the panels, which were fed to Freeform to make jigs. Freeform ended up making six reconfigurable jigs to uh, manufacture all these various panels. And in the end, this is what the space looks like. Um, so naturally, um, when you walk in, it has the effects of that African teak, and when the light's off, um, the idea is that the walls would blush, much like a performer um, blushing before they, they perform on stage. Uh, so making for performance, and really being inspired by the performance of materials. Um, making this process. So as you all know, I don't have to really lecture you on process, but um, one of the most inspiring things that someone ever told me was um, making is a lot like Darwinism, where um, like us, like anything, it's an evolutionary process. And as you evolve an idea, as you make every model and go on to the next one, it is becoming better, more refined, uh, more sophisticated, you can argue. But in the end, the best, strongest uh, idea will win. Um, maybe time will run out. But if time runs out, at least you've gone through all the stages to evolve that idea. And this is just showing uh, basically the life of a project from the very early study models where we work with chipboard. Um, we work with laser cut models, we work with hand cut models. Uh, this is a mixture of hand cut and uh, laser cut models. And you can argue that a lot of these look the same, but there are subtleties, right? That there's um, there, there are subtle differences which really make a project or a model really speak for itself or uh, allow you to find inspiration or continue on to the next model, right? That when you pick something up and explore it, you start to refresh and think of what else can be possible and then you regenerate a new one. So uh, this is for a creative art center in uh, Brown University. Uh, we were challenged with the fact that the Creative Arts Center has all these uh, disciplines in it, uh, music, um, sound, um, uh, dance, theater, and the idea was that um, they would all be housed and they, the, the program was so that the building was shifted so everyone can sort of like cross-pollinate visually. But I'm gonna focus mostly on the skin of the building, which had this simple part T 
um, you know, give the space the privacy that they need because the facade is actually very uh, exposed, it's all glass. So make the sides and the rear of the building, which are more pedestrian, surge related, uh, a bit more private, but also give them some sunlight. So we thought of this idea of crimping um, with just fabric in the beginning. And early on in SMAG design and design development, you know, you're rushing to find what are the materials that this be made out of. This is uh, one of the presentation models, which, were, which was 3D printed. But let's face it, we're not going to 3D print an entire facade of the building. Maybe next year, maybe next 10 years, possibly, but not now, it's just not um, conducive to the uh, client's wallet. So we ended up working with a local fabricator uh, upstate where uh, they used the Lucabond panels. A Lucabond is a, a market term for aluminum composite uh, resin panels basically two sheets of aluminum with the resin in between. And based on the tooling of the material, you can back route and fold the material uh, to create these um, various shapes. Um, you could also do this with just a handsaw and a jig running it through. Uh, alternatively, you could do it with solid aluminum. If you get quarter inch aluminum and get a fine tooth blade, you could actually start to bend a lot of these yourself. Um, and this is uh, one of the mock-ups we made. So going on the process of uh, making, um, we make drawings, we make mock-ups. We review the mock-up before we say go ahead and fabricate everything. Uh, we review the details. This is actually one of the construction details for, for the skin. And this is the uh, final project. Um, so although it is composed of many, many parts and pieces, um, you could actually just have it all automated with the use of CNC technology. Um, but again, this wasn't able to be um, uh, thought of without being inspired by some very simple hand, hand models and explorations. Uh, making this practice, so um, like I said early on, um, I was raised as a very analog thinker and became a late digital thinker. And over the past uh, two and a half years, I've worked for a design build practice. Um, and I've been working on a single project. This is actually a pool house, um, P O O L, um, as opposed to pool house. So the pool house was uh, conceived of as a result of another pool house being um, just in shambles. So this was a demo and completely new rebuild. And as a design and build firm, we understand that there's more risk, absolutely, because we're not just the designer, we're the builder. So, uh, but you can also argue that there's less risk because we're in complete control. We do the drawings and we do the building. So as a senior architect, um, I transition to a senior construction manager when we break ground. So I'm not only the one who builds models and does the drawings, I'm the one who's managing the subcontractors to make sure that they're building this detail accordingly. Uh, this is an example of one of our drawings. Um, typically you see cross sections and plans and drawings. We like to make axonometrics, perspectives, exploded axonometrics, because it's really the junctions which are poorly represented in drawings, which can be represented in 3D much better. So when they're installing glass, or the mullions, we know exactly where pieces go, where bolts and um, flashing goes. Um, so there's no way to interpret, there's no room to interpret the drawings. Because uh, the typical process is architects draw, builders build, and it's the architect's job to visit the site and observe to make sure that things are in accordance. Um, it's a real pleasure being on site, working with other um, fabricators and builders. There's an entire community of builders and makers um, in the world uh, who live in these niches of neighborhoods who are incredibly skilled with experience, uh, years of experience, right? Guys who are 60 years old who uh, understand iron working. And here I am, just 32 year old, what do I know? But my experience is, especially at UB and as a professor, communication and collaboration is really invaluable because you speak with them and you talk, and in the end, you realize you're cut from the same cloth. It's just 
you're hiring a worker, I'm an architect. In the end, we want what's best for the project in the end. We do mock-ups uh, practically for anything. This is actually one of the ceiling mock-ups. We explore the different uh, or wide range of materials from corrugated, perforated aluminum to acrylic, uh, formed acrylic. This, the, some material here is from three form as well. Uh, we go to the stone quarry, we build stone mock-ups um, using actual material. Um, because every material is very different. Yes, it has different properties, but also different handling. Um, to handle acrylic is much different than handling uh, 300 pound slab of slate. Um, but we go to these places and talk to the actual makers. We want to get in their heads and know what they're thinking so that when I'm on site watching these guys do the work, I know what's cut for. Um, so the interior of the pool house is composed of these um, custom uh, plasma cut uh, trusses. This is actually the, this truss here, which was being uh, installed at this time. Uh, that was a 50 foot piece of three quarter inch steel plate that was plasma cut. Um, and then the flange was hand welded on. And um, in the right is a rendering which shows the finished product. Um, the picture on the left was taken about uh, two days ago. And the picture on the right is the finished rendering. So we can see a lot of glass. Uh, the three form ceiling is installed. Um, and on the right would be the finished product, and on the left was taken yesterday. Um, and that's my practice at the moment. Where we are now, how we took these ideas of uh, 
uh, concept and translated them to a point where they could be fabricated or made. Uh, so the classic example of making the builder architect, uh, we're all familiar with this, or most of us are, is Brunelleschi's dome. Um, and we know that uh, Brunelleschi made these um, full-scale templates and drawings uh, by the side of the Arno and um, made templates in the sand to construct these ribs um, at full scale. So this is sort of completely different from the way that we develop buildings now. We, um, I would argue that we digitally make a building now before we construct it, especially something that's as complex and large as a, as a hospital. So um, this, um, what you're starting to see here is the beginnings, uh, is the culmination rather of uh, roughly two years of um, design and production by a team of roughly 50 people in approximately six cities, uh, working collaboratively on one single model, uh, multiple trades, um, interacting in real time, constructing this building in great detail. Uh, so what you see here actually is what we call the electrical model. So you can see on the lower uh, left-hand corner is the switch here. Um, and so it, it, the scale of this, just so you understand, is um, you have the switch here, you have things that are modeled from the switch here, all the way down to electrical switches and outlets and receptacles and things like that. Um, I'll fly through a couple of these. This is the fire protection model. This is the plumbing model. Uh, we're all sort of familiar with this axonometric system uh, drawing, I think. The HVAC model. All of these are then combined as this really complex kit of parts. And what's really interesting about that is that you have all these people making changes in real time uh, and developing these drawings to such great detail that we're, we're out ahead of the process. So we're, we're, we promise the client that there's very few change orders on the job because we go through and we coordinate to such a high level. We all sort of know that that's a fallacy, that that's really never fully achievable. Um, uh, so what could go wrong in the modeling process, we try to avoid, we develop these strategies um, and what we call uh, clash detection is, is this one strategy that we've developed um, that's pretty much industry standard for um, going through and reviewing what is in the model and how, um, how all these little tiny bits and pieces relate to each other. So we make sure that there's clearances for insulation and we make sure that ducts aren't running through steel members. Um, and we, we literally look on a case-by-case -case basis at all of this and we run these really complex reports and we communicate with each other as if we're building the building. Um, and not only do we build the solids, we also build the clearances, we build the voids. So you're seeing these red, these red voids are what we call uh, clearance zones are what I call no-fly zones because it, it uh, indicates areas where we don't want certain trades to run conduit or plumbing or um, what have you. So it, it's also about clearances for access to things like smoke dampers and things like that that typically designers aren't really thinking about and typically come up in the field as, a, as an oh crap moment. Right? You're like, oh, all right, how am I going to deal with this? So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to construct the building. And I understand that it has its own pitfalls also, but I think as best we can right now, we're trying to construct the building um, with this great level of detail so that it's an easier process during construction. Um, sometimes it can be too detailed, though. And we, the, one of the pitfalls is you can be really uh, detailed, and so on the on the right hand side, you'll see a green circle with a with a dimension that says 255, 256th of an inch. And so, I mean, I I think that this is not only. I mean, this has been around since you know the advent of computer modeling and um, computer aided drafting and whatever. But it is so incumbent now that this is happening. It's so incumbent on the designer, architect, um, to model these buildings and. and 
know how these buildings go together in three dimensions in such a high degree now that you can't round numbers, you can't, um, there is no more um, tolerance in the modeling itself. What's really important uh, also is this, this idea of communication. I think James was talking about this also, like how you coordinate in the field you don't work in a vacuum. As designers now, you're working with this huge team of people who are all working simultaneously on moving all these bits and pieces. It's a really fluid um, process. And so everyone needs to be communicating and everyone needs to be speaking the same language. So there's projects where um, you, know, you have certain people working in one platform and other people working in another platform. And those are the projects that tend to have more problems. Because you're not catching, you're not really virtually building the building. Um, you're kind of leaving it to guesswork. You're leaving it to more of that more traditional two-dimensional coordination that a lot of architects have been trained uh, to to watch and, and to coordinate over time um, in a more um, hands-on way. Uh, so we don't the model that we make when we make these models, these virtual models, these digital models, are not, it's not the end of the model. Um, what we, there's various levels of detail, just ranging from level 100 to 400. Um, typically, the design documents are somewhere between 300 and 350. Um, I think it's pretty apparent some of the differences. Uh, what is interesting, though, is that once we have developed this building, this virtual building, we then hand it over to the contractor. So the contractor then is responsible for uh, fabricating digitally all of the details, the shop drawings, um, and then further coordinating those details with the rest of the trades. So to such a high level that um, you can see here, so the, you know, originally the design documents will show somewhere between 300 and 350, um, by the time the contractor is done with it, they will have things like gusset plates, welds, screws, so on and so forth. The reason that's important is because, you know, there, there are parts and pieces of any building that just show off, that the designer just doesn't know about. There's all this minutia out there that no one really understands until it's built. Um, you can't place every screw or every nut in a, in a design well, not yet anyways. So, it's really important that once the contractor has a chance to, to do that, there's this, com there's this conversation, I guess, is what happens. There's this conversation between the design team and the fabricator and the builder to the point where we trade models and we go back and forth and this conversation continues until shop drawings are approved, until mock-ups are built and then approved um, and fully coordinated so that it takes a lot of the guesswork out conceivably, some of the guesswork, I should say, out of actually building the building. Um, so I think also what's really coming to the fore here um, and looking forward and how, how all of this digital technology now is going to influence us as architects, designers, and the field in general um, is what are the contract documents? You know, we're held to these really stringent um, ideas that you know you could have an error or an omission in the document and currently still it's the two-dimensional representation so currently we develop this model and from that model we create these sheets and those sheets are stamped by licensed architects and, and they're put out for permit and then uh, you know bid and, and, and fabricated or constructed um, and that's a traditional model on the left um, now what's happening is the builders are getting the two-dimensional representation, but they're also getting the three-dimensional representation. So there is this strange gray zone where they have the two-dimensional drawings, which are legally the contract documents, but they also have the three-dimensional model where maybe you fudge something or maybe you hid an element. And so they can analyze that. They can't call you on it, but they can analyze it. Um, and so I think What's happening now and in the future, I think that we're going to move more towards this model where uh, the three-dimensional model will become the contract documents, where the three-dimensional model is going to have to be modeled with such precision 
Um, and you know, with this approach that the designer is building the building prior to actually handing it over to a contractor to fabricate it, uh, that um, that will be three-dimensional model will be the construction document uh, of the future. Thank you.
thanks to all of our speakers. Um, the talks were really, really great and, and diverse. Uh, I wanted to, to maybe have a little over 20 minutes or so to um, maybe open up to questions. I have uh, many, many questions that I was jotting down as, as they were talking. And um, when I was thinking about this, it was somehow, uh, and I think the, the focuses that emerged out of the talks were really clear in terms of how do things change when you work directly with the material at a small scale versus um, then a literally physical separation starting to happen between um, people who are trained to think um, directly with the materials. Um, that, that role changes um, as, as projects get bigger and as careers begin to develop. Um, this question of the community comes up in lots of interesting ways as to how we define the community in which we uh, design for, design with, and, and the role of the clients in that process. And, and then maybe other, other topics about um, collaboration in terms of how, uh, given uh, contemporary or let's say current trends in, in the way things are made, uh, how are more collaborative models being established to try and um, hopefully improve the, the quality of the built environment. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there, there's many more observations, but I thought uh, we should try and uh, open this up for questions and, and see what some of the reactions are from the audience. which 
raises this debate on what's the culture of making. Um, and I think there's a, you can argue there's an infinite amount of means and methods as to maybe how, how it's made, but I think it comes down to context. I think it comes down to the user, the program, um, the type of building that you're making. Uh, there are a lot of variables, and I think as architects, we have the uh, mental capacity to think of well, what is the most efficient, most interesting way to uh, make this come to fruition, whether it's a hand model or if it's a building. Um, and I think it's just it's the, it's the appreciation for what we make that I think defines a culture of making. Otherwise, it becomes politics. For me, I think um, <clears throat> I try to blur the boundary as much as possible because, uh, and, and you can see that through the projects that I'm kind of presenting here and through the scale that I'm working at. So, um, the logic and kind of the back and forth process of making and designing and going back and forth and testing things out and you know, finding that however it is through you know physical model and drawing and whatnot. I mean, it's something I do myself in my practice through some of the projects I've shown here. <clears throat> I'm also looking in the house with a lot of holes in it right now that I've been constructing for two and a half years. It was built in 1797. So, um, but I take that into my classroom as well. So, um, you know, that kind of back and forth, the building at full scale, the, the back to the drafting table, back to modeling, back to material study, studies, back to representations of material studies and spatial conditions and experiential aspects and, and everything. So, for me, the dream is to blur that so that there is no differentiate. There, there is no differentiation, I guess, between the academic realm and the professional realm of sculpture making. That's my dream. But at my scale, it's much easier than say a huge or large, right? So small is sort of that that word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, not that everybody's talking about every topic, but like um, the idea of like merging merging yourself immersion, I guess rather. Uh, it's like when I was looking at some of the presentations, like of the larger ones, like and I think it's much easier to comprehend. And it, it, like when you were uh, James talking about like the idea of, um, or I think you were talking about the idea of like multi, like materials and things are getting more complicated. It used to be, or this was something Chris's topic of, of, you have a bunch of materials now. Like it used to be like wood, stone, glass, all these other things. And so to to immerse yourself into that with the fabricators is quite simple. I'm kind of curious, and when we get into the larger scale projects, because, like, when, and that just maybe a question back to the panel, like with, with Jared's project, like specifically with the last one, it's like, when do we have to engage the other people that are makers? Are we choreo choreographing them now? Because we have an understanding of all these things, but like, if I'm drawing a model, like what you're talking about at the end there, uh, I need to know, I need to have the team member that does the welding there to understand how that thing goes in, because otherwise. You will become liable for all those kind of drawings as the process goes forward. So until we can 3D print a building that's completely stable from just a plastic material, you know, um, we're going to have to kind of have that conversation. Like a lot of the work that I work on is illegal, right? A lot of the work that that you know you're you know it's just it's just you know in terms of to actually kind of work with the fabricators directly. Uh, sometimes the, the process of engineering is not always 100 percent complete. You just you know double the amount of steel you need. You double you know. Put more concrete down, and you go, yeah, this works. Now, again, that's for like, more sculptural projects and more kind of spatial projects. But I see that kind of same element with with the, the modeling you're talking about because I think and the same thing with the design build. I mean, this is not a question for that. Would be when you're on like, design build for me. The beauty of that is you don't have to do all your drawings, right? You can go out there and say, hey, hey, Joe, can you go up there and weld that thing? You know, it's pretty cool, right? You know, or like. You can actually have that conversation direct one-on-one. -on -one. You don't have to like, waste your time, not you know, <laughs> waste your time detailing every single thing, right? So that's like the blur that I'm kind of interested in. It's like that blur of being responsible for everything because we have to kind of micromanage every single thing. Or is it more of a communication where we actually engage the people that are building more directly? And I mean, bring them on the team if we are going to do these models like, right into the right. teams. Because I think it has to do with the relationship that you have with these you know, subcontractors that you're working with, these fabricators that you're working with. Doing the, the aluminum work or whatever, and what kind of relationship you have with that person? Do you pull him on so he becomes a part of your team instead of just being a subcontracted, you know, 
work that's being done. And then that communication between the two of you, right, becomes much more fluid and loose because it doesn't have to be three-dimensionally detailed like you're showing us here, although that always helps, right, because that's you thinking through it, thinking through the materials, thinking through kind of covering the butt a little bit too so that, you know, if you're not out there all the time saying, hey, could you get up there and weld that? They know to get up there and weld that in a specific way. Right, and it goes back to Jerry's case where the three model, I, I believe, will eventually become the construction documents as well because it, it's a way to manage the builder. Mm -hmm. It's a way to streamline communication. It's a way <coughs> where both you can uh, trust one another that you don't have to micromanage. Like the drawings are managing you there, right? Um, as, um, as an architect in a design build uh, office, on site, um, I mean, this, this pool house is relatively small, it's taking over two years because of us having to forge those relationships with all builders, mm -hmm. right? Like after the drawings, we, we met with uh, a variety of bidders in each discipline, right? Uh, we met with three, four stonemasons, we met with three, four uh, glazers, uh, three or four ironworkers to, to figure out like who who is willing to collaborate and communicate with us the most? Mm -hmm. um, and then what drawings are they expecting? Um, we don't use um, BIM software. Mm -hmm. we, we generate most of our three-dimensional drawings using Rhino. Mm -hmm. um, and then that representation is put in the construction documents. Um, so I, I, I think we are evolving to something like what Jared is presenting. Uh, but I think there is still the same intent that uh, we want to be clear, yeah. right? Um, but at, at that same time, it's a business. Everyone's in it for <coughs> for the money uh, because these subcontractors were hired by us as a construction manager, and uh, they let's face it, they want change orders to make more money. And if the drawing uh, is there, which sort of lives on, on, on its own, then what? Why take it? But I'll admit that going through drawings, going through uh, the bidding phase, the meetings, the coordination meetings, meeting with the owners, the foreman, all that we did with SWAT, if their welder doesn't know what was drawn, mm -hmm. right? So that's why the project is taking so long, because there's so much coordination. Maybe because we're producing so many pretty much drawings, and maybe something like the software can help expedite that something that's a bit more well organized. Uh, I think the, the, our team it, this is composed of a series of analog digital thinkers and they like this idea of um, uh, rhinoceros modeling and drawing mm -hmm. and I'll admit half of them are scared shit of moving to Revit because they don't want to deal with the complexities of it but there's an enormous benefit to it and I, I, I'm just getting into trying to Coast into it because it's going to make our lives easier in the game. Yeah. Well, knowing which tool to use, right, it is you know, you have a plethora of tools, analog and digital, and, you know, in our, in our toolboxes, so to say, right, and knowing which ones are the best to engage with or whatever the, you know, whatever the, the project is at hand, right, right. the assignment is, is really important, right, so right. absolutely. I mean, especially when you're working on things like uh, residential size projects. Well, I, I think uh, oh, oh, having my own house 
too. I think we come to all of our own show experiments. And, <laughs> um, I mean, I, and, and as a new father, I, uh, I, I wish I had more time to experiment with materials because I mean, let's admit it, you know, we look at a, a, a wall and we feel the wall and we start to permeate ideas on how to manipulate material. And um, I would love to, and unfortunately right now it's only limited to the projects I'm working in uh, and a time dedicated to, to the work. But um, I'll, I'll admit, I, I, I live and breathe material exploration. And when I walk into Nick and Chris's office, I'm drooling, like I'm wetting my pants. <laughs> because I, I, I want to be there. I want, I want to be making bending metal with them. I want to be casting and breathing in the formal cement. Um, <laughs> but, uh, sure. but there's certain circumstances, right? But I, I, I'd say that when, when you have the opportunity, right? When you have the opportunity, or even if you don't, try and carve the opportunity to experiment with materials. Because it's only going to make you a better thinker about the materials and become you, make, make you more intimate with it. Are you saying it's not part of pra like practice? Now, in terms of this time to experiment, or that it does this, the current structure, as the way it's been described in three or four variations, does not permit that looseness. It's, it's not fun. always expected. I think, I think yeah. there, there are sophisticated clients that expect experimentation to be part of that process, right? And I think some of the skills that some of the your guys' projects are getting to that point, you know, where you're using travertine, you're using like, you know, custom steel you know, columns and beams and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. But I think that the, it's that conversation. Where if you're working on a pedestrian level project, I mean, when I when I go to a client, I want to go to a wine bar, right? Okay, it's like you know that's cool. Let's go talk about wine bar. But when can I get the rendering and the budget? You know, and they just talk about like that's where they want to get to like you know, within a week's time. Like they want to render before the ideas are even I mean, solidified that they want a wine shop or whatever they're going to do. So I think it's that communication of how do you and this is something we're trying to bridge right now in our office. Like we're we're actually evolving our team to to start to kind of build more of that research component. But me now that I'm teaching <laughs> full time, I can start to use that as a research element and start to bring that in. That comes back to the whole thing. It's like I think most people that are playing around with us have spent a lot of their own personal time that they're not necessarily being compensated for to help evolve their own practice in order to practice, like, get to that level where they can actually be more instinctual with it. In reality, it's just like anybody I know that's working in these fields, if they don't sleep much, and which is great. I mean, we're up in architecture school, we all know we all like push the students to stay up super late, but it's really not being uh, funded through the practice typically. Until you get to the scale where people are like, that guy's hot stuff, like, or that firm's hot stuff, but I'll, I'll, I'll do that, you know. Or for large like projects, like some of the, the Revit stuff being driven strictly by governmental necessity. They're like, we're not gonna touch that project unless we do it in Revit. And then, so that's bringing some of the larger offices. In our office, we can't afford the Revit software. It's like $7,000 a package a year, it's like, you know, it's like you know, maybe an employee, you know, <laughs> like for like, the So we, we, we play back and forth with it and tease it, but um, I think some of the cost, and, and especially in our market where I'm at, it's, you know, we almost exclusively work in the city, and our explorations are what do we find in the space? What can we use? Um, I enjoy that kind of work, but at the same time, it's not for like, uh, you know, the type of experimentation where you get beyond it. I mean, I would say for, for our part, we find. I mean, on a project of that scale, we find places where we can experiment. So, uh, I'll give one example. I left some of this out for you know for the interest of time, but there's this really complicated system of alarming in a psychiatric facility uh, where all the staff have these these wireless uh, fobs where they can set off an alarm if they have an emergency. And Bosch, take you living drills. Um, have fabricated the same wall-mounted device for every psychiatric facility in the world. And it's this horrible looking beige box that sits on the wall with these blinking lights. And so we took it upon ourselves to redesign that and to work with Bosch to and work with a plastic fabricator to re to propose a new box that more or less just house their contents, but to flush it with the wall. Um, and so, you know, we Took what you know what is happening in this in this larger project, and then sort of branched out to smaller fabricators and did these experiments. To um, ultimately, I think we sold it. We're in the process of selling it, um, so that instead of this beige box that sticks on the wall, it'll be this maybe it's three form some type of resin um, panel that is 
translucent that really blends in with the rest of the, the wall surface. Uh, so are, you guys, are you guys building that kind of research into like a patent type of situation where you guys are gonna have ownership of the concept? We talked about that, yeah. It's always just doing the design work for free, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, well, there's a lot of pushback though from these companies because you have to think about they have probably have a backlog, a back stock of millions of these units and they don't want to change. Um, so, you know, but you have a huge client like the Office of Mental Health who puts these in every single new facility, so there's millions of dollars on the line for the business for them. So there's this huge dialogue and conversation that goes, goes on with that, specifically the business side of it as well. And for me, if there's, I mean, one of the projects I showed is a, it's called the Sound Garden. It's like a project I've been working on in series for years now, and so I've been playing around with formation. Basically, I've been playing around with cones like forever. And different dimensions, different materials, and right now I'm building one for the west side of Buffalo. It's a public art initiation through Sipa Gallery. And I've been building these cones out of different materials and playing around with different reflective, sound reflective materials, wrapping them, playing around with cones and the shapes of the cones and seeing how it projects sounds and how I hear it on the other side and you know, playing around with my phone basically and standing away from it and <laughs> going back and forth, having people yell into it at me, vice versa. And, and um, you know, playing around with chipboard phones, just making sure that again the formations, the scale of it actually is appropriate in the amplification of sound, it actually does function. Now I'm looking into low density polyethylene and near low density polyethylene materials because I'm thinking that's what I'm going to be fabricating it out of kind of thing. So for me, um, uh, for me that's that's integral to my projects is that you know I, I could be playing around with, with with paper in order just to form these ideas, but when it comes down to actually constructing it, I want to be sure that it's functioning and doing the things that I anticipate through my conceptual ideology. And so There's only so much that I can do with the design of it because I'm dealing with logs. I'm literally out there and I'm debarking trees that are various sizes that I can't take inventory of because they're stacked and they're hundreds and hundreds of pounds and I have four interns working with me and we're trying to figure it out. They have a rough idea, right? But like you have to get out there and it's about having your hands on the material and exploring with it and making sure that it's going to do some of these things that you're thinking through. But it's the material exploration is then a part of the process of design for me because it's uh, that's it's the only way that I actually can figure out the design is figuring out the material at the same time and going back and forth. So we maybe have time for one more <coughs> question. Well, I, I just would like um, to have some of the presenters see that one particular issue. Uh, so as I'm watching the presentations. I realized that I could probably rename this panel the process of making as opposed to the culture of making. And most of what you said would fit into that. However, some of you seem to have a larger overriding goal that um, you, um, you're able to garner several more affordances by using kind of digital process, right? So for example, when, I, when I'm thinking about um, Jared's presentation and he's talking about the extensive amount of control that you could have over the building, the budget, um, it, it occurs to me that you might be able to use that to eke out a little bit more space for other types of things. So really then, it's about what value system you come with that allows you to figure out where you need to optimize so that you can afford other types of processes. Or the projects that I saw uh, I described in Detroit, for example, there's a, there's a cultural landscape around that that could benefit from a, a particular type of approach that allows for certain types of communities to now have the same access to um, high-end design that wouldn't be available previously. So in my mind, there's a kind of professional culture that's about processes and techniques. But then there's a larger conversation about the cultures that these things then afford. And to me, the, the I mean, uh, I guess my, my most critical one would be um, when uh, I can't remember, I, I'm going to get, I'm not going to say anything, I'm going to get it wrong. But when you talk about sort of uh, these processes that are sort of Darwinian and, and using kind of a proto-Darwinian kind of framework to analyze this, I mean, to me there are a lot of uh, um, problems with that kind of uh, framework. I mean, when we think about the 20th century and, and where Darwinian processes brought us and, 
this kind of a proto-eugenic type of thinking that, that starts to occur. So how do we as architects uh, think about our processes of making critically in relationship to the cultures that we're starting to generate? So we're going to borrow from biology. How do we do this responsibly without repeating the mistakes of the 20th century? If we're going to deal with in underserved communities, how do we match and align the processes of making that we have with the, the larger cultural um, processes that we're um, affording or, or disabling. And, and to me, I guess um, that's a connection that I'm trying to make in all of your presentations. And I think some of them are much more um, uh, um, easier to identify because it's not just a kind of inter or an internal disciplinary conversation about how can I make cooler things, cooler shapes, cooler forms. But it's about sort of, um, I'm serving a particular community, they have specific needs, and so that's forcing me to become much more innovative in my processes. So I guess I, I, I would like, I mean, because we have a lot of students in this room, right? And I think in, in the larger discourse of digital technologies, there's confusion between thinking that um, techniques is the same thing as, as culture. And it's not the same thing. Um, uh, it's a, that, that, that only makes sense to somebody who is only an architect and who only wants to talk to an architect. So, so I guess for me, I would, I would, it would be useful if you could clarify some of those um, external cultural uh, paradigms or values that help you to, to really figure out what types of processes uh, you, you will choose. Kind of to be so it's art school, yeah. go ahead, non-architecture friends. So it was, uh, <laughs> at some level, um, you know, I think that for me, and I, I may be misunder, uh, I may misrespond in some levels. Um, for me, I think, the, the cultural component of it is the social element of it. Uh, the experimentation, the engagement with um, the client or community or other players that are participating. Like I, we've now started building up teams of, of fabricators that we like work with. I'm like, hey, Tyru, uh, what do you got? You know, let's, let's, let's meet up and chat about it. So in terms of the cultural component, I think that the idea is that how do we actually get um, a deeper solution through conversation and through through the act of making together versus the idea of uh, the diagram where the architect's at the top, right? And the architect is just like, this person is just like, okay, the architect's part of a team, and that team has all these different elements of it. Um, again, there might be a little bit of coordination happening because we do have a, somewhat, sometimes a, an understanding of a lot of the different skills it might take from financing to to uh, the legal aspects, to the material aspects, and all that kind of stuff, and exposed to those things. So how do we actually kind of bring all the other players into things? So for me, what I enjoy about architecture is the fact that I get to hang out with people and, and learn stuff from them, and then try to do something with it. Um, it's not very profitable in terms of, you know, because there's a lot of time that's engaged with that. Um, and that's something that I'm still kind of uh, struggling with, whether or not this is just, you know, uh, lifestyle of architecture versus uh, profession uh, in some ways. I mean, I, I want to tag team off of that because I think that what's really interesting is that the process that, at least that I described, creates is maybe the generator of a different culture. I mean, I think that that process generates this culture um, where there is this value placed on the maker, where um, the design, you know, this, the value that we typically place on the designer. Uh, as the head of the pyramid has really, I think, um, been reformatted, or maybe it's that the designer and the builder are now equals, more so now than in the past. Um, and so it is great to work with fabricators and have them on the team, and the fact that um, you know the process necessitates this, this huge, um, there's this huge emphasis on the culture of collaboration with the builder. Uh, I think that that's really where, I mean, I think that's that's what is evolving out of all of this. I think that the process is, is pushing us towards this more collaborative culture. I also think that it brings people to the field who are more inclined to make. I think that it creates this culture where, um, you know, we see these people, you know, the people who, you know, and I'll just speak, you know, from on a professional level, people who you want to bring into a business, into a, into a, into a firm that, are, that is you know, working on a certain scale, on certain projects, are the makers. You want, the, you want that culture of collaboration in an office, and you want them to be able to reach out and collaborate with the, with the welder. Um, you want 
want to be able, you want them to be able to speak that same language. Um, and I think I was a little unclear about that, but I really think that I mean, that level of communication, that level of, um, you know, the, it's the whole Tower of Babel thing, I think. And I know that's sort of sim simpl simplistic, but um, I think that, you know, the way that the designer and the builder interact now is, is much more unified than <coughs> That's, I think that's the cultural impact. Mr. Hurley's talking about the production of space. Well, well, I mean, uh, well, this is a, yeah, really interesting. It helps me to figure out sort of who gets included now in the new economic model, but also who is excluded. Right. And so uh, if certain things aren't seen as material, as um, empirical, as fabricating things, then those things can marginalize us in culture. And I think that that's really important to, to describe, I mean, especially if we're, we're thinking about this particular um, Forum and think about the history of the school of the University of Buffalo and, and what kind of values were sort of experimented with originally. Um, people like Mike Brill and others, they weren't making very much of anything. Or, or I worked in his office and, and he was working with office plates, right? So in that sense, he's thinking about space, the dynamics of space and how to manage that over time. And he didn't, as an architect, put together much of anything. I, I never did. Um, shop drawings in his, in his office, but but the impact was just as equal as that of the architect. So so I mean, in this sense, I, I, from from my own personal background, um, I was sort of jealously look for other forms of collaboration that aren't purely based on materiality, that aren't purely based on fabrication, but do allow for collaboration that deals with some of the broader elements of the environment. And then then I could sort of see how this model offers a new paradigm for somebody who wants to do what it is that you guys are doing, but also some of the other uh, traditional domains of the architecture design. I would, I would look more on the side of the spectrum that Jared's on, and I think part of what he's talking about is very internal process oriented piece, I agree with you. But actually, if you dig down into some of these projects, like mental health projects, for example, that he's talking about, uh, an enormous amount of that coordination is going into a deep understanding of the people that are being served. And uh, you know, you put the wrong door handle on and people die <coughs> in facilities like that. And I'm sure Jared can talk about that to some deep level. And so it's there are external communities that you're serving and internal communities that you're serving, and you have to serve them both. So like the external community in a mental health facility like that could be the taxpayers that are funding that administration, or if it's like the veterans community, you will work with those people. And so to try to maximize the value that they get for that tax dollar and that that's going, those are things that, you know, Jared talked about 50 something people on the project. I can say, having worked on those projects, that you're very deeply invested in serving those people as well as you can. So I think a lot of your talk was about how you gain this incredible process oriented control on the project. But ultimately, that's because. As a profession, especially at that level of profession, we're being forced, we're being pushed to maximize our value and our return on investment for the users as, as the client defines the users. And I would say some of those clients, like the mental health community, the veterans community, these clients are becoming much more sophisticated and broad based in how they define the users, both the people that are serving or the people that are being served in the communities that they sit in. We recently did one out to help uh, facility up in Canada where um, it's a very, uh, it's a criminal mental health facility, but their hockey space is also serving the community. So kids come in and use the hockey space. So there's a, there's a lot of that stuff. I don't think that's really what Jared was talking about, but part of the control that you have to have is so that you can verify that you can serve those communities. And it's kind of fun. Yeah, I mean, I guess I follow you more if, um if when we're saying talking about making, it's not making a thing. Like if, if it's if the making that we have is not just only object oriented, but we're making spaces, we're making relationships, we're making uh, different types of, of uh, environments. Then, then I, I I follow right. Then it's not sort of just this. Um, we're returning back to the medieval builder, and it's the the master builder, and it's about greater the greater control of the architect to make another kind of iconic object that's much more reflective of his or her signature style. Um, if, if we're generous with that, that term about making, and we're critical about that term of culture, and what it actually affords us, 
I feel like I follow a, a bit more, and I can I can uh, accept some of the, the comments that, that you're sort of bringing up in terms of how the artist is critically engaged. But but I, I mean I think that like being that precise is really very helpful. It helps uh, somebody who is a student who's looking on who who wants to understand what it is that they're participating in, and we don't just give them a sense that you're rolling up your sleeve like the medieval builder, right? and you're kind of like, you know, this is another way of making cool objects. I mean, of course you can do that, uh, but, but that, that shouldn't be the, the kind of the cool yeah, perspective. I, I think that's what the, most of the speakers were saying they would do under the circumstance. It, in fact, none of them seem to can, can even operate in that method of working unless you're in school, right? It's like that's the time when you can, you can afford yourself the deep investment into a material as a means to learn, but you move into practice in those models of approach, you can't approach the problem the same way. For me, it's a question as a lot of us and a lot of people in this room are, um, have taught or spent a great time teaching students, and I think you posed the first question um, as that, and I think for me it's how do you take a young design student and, and what do you do first? You know, what, what and is the, uh, the physical object a means to tease out, as you said, or tap out these larger questions? Um, but those, th that question alone takes years to unpack. And so it's, a, it's this pursuit you're trying to set up um, while you're a student at a school like Buffalo that with the hope that now 10, um, you know, any 15 years, when you your, your own thinking starts to mature, you're able to absorb these kinds of questions um, and ultimately produce, I mean, I think the goal is to produce, um, is to not optimize the world for efficiency's sake, the way, um, you know, modernism has tried to, to set up the system, this kind of separate system of specialization. A lot of, a lot of folks here talk about, we've been talking a lot about, um, but, but to, 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 to really improve it, like you said, to make better spaces and better buildings, and I think, um, you almost need to set up the techniques in order to do that, because otherwise we're hiding, you know, we're, we're, we're wedging a greater divide in my mind between kind of the academics and, and the professional world if we don't try and take that question and that struggle on face value. And I think this is a group that's really um, trying to live in both worlds and then move between them as a means to, to hopefully address the larger question that I think you articulated um, incredibly well. It's, it's interesting because um, it, it relates to my career path a little bit because, um, you know, I joined a firm which was very much about the symbology of the architecture and it was much about the techniques and methods of making and exploring materials. And um, a lot of those were competitions. And when you work in a competition, the goal was to make, um, of course, a sexy building. And within that, solve all the needs of the client. Well, who's the client? Where are they from? How many members are on the board? What are all the needs? And I became very frustrated because you're working in designing a vacuum. And all you're thinking of is the program and how can your building be sexier than the one next to you when you're pinned up during the jury. And is that yes. Really, is that really what well, I'm sorry. Is that really what you're thinking? Oh, yeah. As a model maker, as an intern, I'm trying to make sexy buildings. I'm trying to make it really sexy. And at the same time, fulfill the program uh, so that we're not disqualified. And then present the project to principals in the form of solving all of these problems. But let's admit it, aesthetics is a huge variable in architecture. It's huge. And I think right now there's a huge battle because you have certain pedagogies in school which are focused on form making. And uh, post-rationalize a program or trying to fit a program into a building. And I think at, at UB, we're fortunate to um, bridge both sides, where we are told to understand the program, understand problem solving, at the same time, understand materials, how do you build it, how do you work together as a team. And uh, I made a personal decision to join a separate firm to understand more about the process of learning the client. Work with your ears first, not your mouth, not your hands. So that as a design build um, senior architect, we are in a position to bring in the necessary members to the table to talk to them about their needs. 
tell them the advantages of a design-build firm so that we could eliminate change orders because we're the ones who will build it. And we'll bring in members for focus groups. We'll bring in any, any, any member of the community who um, will have a, a, a significant role to play in the project. Um, yes, there are private projects where the only people at the table are you and maybe one or two other people. Um, recently, we started targeting projects, uh, municipal projects, and we've um, erred on the side of success because we are, we're telling them, listen, although we're designers and builders, we want to dedicate a process. You may call it programming, we call it strategy. And we want to strategize the entire process. And we want you to invest the money in this process because a strategy is basically um, envisioning all the steps that have to take place in order to get to the design of the building. And I, I, I think um, in my presentation, you know, I'm focused mostly on, on making because it is a culture making. And I'll admit I, that there may have been a bias towards the uh, object rather than the process. And I'll admit, and all students here, it is a long process. And it's not just about making uh, objects. It's about making a project successful for many, many people. Um, and like I said, it, it's, it's yourself, it's architecture, and it's the client. But the client is composed of many, many people. And to get information from that, those many, many people takes, takes time and certain uh, techniques. Um, but I will still defend making with your hands as um, a, a, a necessity in architecture. But on the outside, you know, the process of the greater making is overlooked. And personally, well, forced, I, forced me to I make those decisions yeah. in my career. I mean, for me, I appreciate the clarification. Like that, you know, like the last whatever, how many yeah. minutes that was? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that made it sort of worth um, being able to see these things and be able to compare them in that way. Um, I just want to say all the projects that I show, uh, and I talked about this a little bit, but the, the idea of the maker is flipped onto the user. So it's all about the creation of the space through the user themselves, activating whatever it might be, a landscape that's flexible, a structure that can transform. And the sound garden and architecture and space is only created through the activation of sound, which is the user itself. So it's not necessarily for me always about the Objectivity of it, it's about the activation and it's about this kind of um, spatial condition that's created that a lot of times is actually intangible. So, I think we should wrap up and maybe uh, conversation will continue after. I, I want to thank um, the panelists, especially who came um, to reflect on uh, what they've been doing. Uh, so, Dad, Camille, Jared, James, thank you for coming. Thank you.